Next week on Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Iron Man just flew by. Oh, can I see? You know what? Just take my word for it. You know, a lot of people say that Marvel's Phase 4 slate, now 5, kind of sucks, or that Disney Plus just has a lot of subpar content. But I don't really see people bringing up how Disney Plus was this new endeavor to bring Marvel Studios into television, and was very much hyped up to be so. Except they've already done that. You're either very much a fan, or very much hate them, but Marvel Television did, but Disney Plus couldn't. And that's on top of them doing it first. I genuinely think, with a couple of exceptions, they're pretty Bomb solid. But you know what else is solid? All the fantastic products from our sponsor, FlexiSpot. FlexiSpot sent me their OC6 upgraded office chair to try, and I am loving it. I've been needing a new chair for a while, and this one was quite the upgrade, and best of all, easy to build. It features a wide and high-density foam lumbar support, upgraded Y-shaped lumbar support, 500 pound weight capacity, reclining back that locks into whatever position you need, adjustable armrests, and seat height. I've always had back issues, even when I was a kid, so comfort to me has always been important. What can I say? This chair is just downright comfortable. Hi. Dude, you want to try my chair? Yeah. Yeah. Even my pet hamster likes it. You can get the chair yourself with my link down in the description. Thanks to FlexiSpot for sponsoring this video. Back to Marvel. So the big question is, what's canon? To answer that, first things first is to meticulously list everything so we know what we're working with. In one quarter, Marvel TV, we have Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., Agent Carter, Daredevil, Jessica Jones, Luke Cage, Iron Fist, The Defenders, Inhumans, The Punisher, Runaways, Cloak and Dagger, and Hellstrom. Maybe. Kinda? Sure. In the other corner, Disney+. Plus. There's WandaVision, The Falcon and the Winter Soldier, Loki, What If, Hawkeye, Moon Knight, Miss Marvel, She-Hulk, Attorney at Law, Secret Invasion, and Echo. For the purposes of this video, I won't be talking about What If, and I also won't be including other shows like I Am Groot and specials like Werewolf by Night and The Guardian's Holiday Special. And of course, there are projects on both sides that were planned and never came to fruition or have yet to be released. We won't be talking about those either. Now that we have that out of the way, let's get into why Marvel would get in on TV in the first place. Simply put, why not expand this money-making cash cow? At the time, it was blockbuster hit after blockbuster hit on the silver screen. It only makes sense to capitalize. Television is the perfect next step. It's no stranger to long-running continuity spanning years or even decades. Marvel wanted to dip their toes, and by Marvel, I mean Ike Perlmutter, a billionaire businessman who was in charge of Marvel Entertainment. He's also a part-time cartoon villain, literally standing in the shadows with Donald Trump. How is this an actual picture? Anyway, Perlmutter wanted to branch out and rake in the dough. Meanwhile, he would be stepping all over the true mastermind behind the MCU, Kevin Feige. Despite his meticulous plans for the franchise, the first show under the new production company, Marvel Television, was greenlit. Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. and many more would follow. Feige was not having it with Perlmutter. Going over his head, he would split Marvel Studios away from Perlmutter's diabolical hands. Apparently, Perlmutter's input into the MCU was very difficult to work with and was the reason for not getting films like Black Panther and Captain Marvel out earlier. In Captain Marvel's case, at least, women just don't sell well, according to this leaked email. Yike. Unfortunately, the split led to a weird relationship between Marvel TV and Marvel Studios that went against their initial advertising campaign. Oh great, now he's affecting canon! This has gone too far! And if you've been watching Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., you've gotten to see how that show dances in and out of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. In the early stages of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D.'s promotions, it was explicitly stated that the characters interact with each other. Everything was within the same universe, made abundantly more clear by the fact that the pilot episode of S.H.I.E.L.D. begins with a montage spliced with shots from the Avengers. S.H.I.E.L.D., out of all the shows, would be the one that was most interactive with the wider MCU, actively weaving its plot around whichever film came out around that time, such as showing the cast cleaning up after the events of Thor The Dark World. And don't get me started on the tie-in to Winter Soldier. If you've seen that movie, you're probably thinking, didn't some major stuff go down with S.H.I.E.L.D.? Yes, and this show takes a massive turn in response to it. Characters from the films would also make appearances, such as Nick Fury, Maria Hill, Lady Sif, Agent Carter and the Howling Commandos, and of course, Agent Phil Coulson. Wait, didn't he die? You wanna find out? I thought 
you were dead. Oh, I thought you were dead too. Eventually, as the show went on, it became a little more clear that the relationship was more one way. The show would mention events of the film, even pulling elements from them, but the films wouldn't do so, or at least it was more vague about it. Before Endgame, Nick Fury makes one line during Age of Ultron that hints at the plot of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., but it can be taken as a throwaway and not an overt reference. Pulled her out of mothballs with a couple of old friends. She's dusty, but she'll do. No one would bat an eye and think of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. as the reason for the Hellcarrier's appearance during Age of Ultron, but it was clear the direction the films were going didn't have the shows in mind. Despite this, the shows still tried to keep up, even if it meant people were asking, where are the Avengers? Especially when you consider things are supposedly still set in the same world. <laughs> about Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., would you, any of you be a part of that show? <laughs> sure! <laughs> Why the fuck you lying? So clearly, that makes it non-canon, right? Well, hold your horses, we're not done. Even with this one-sided, ugly stepchild relationship, Marvel TV still had a working partnership with Marvel Studios. Certain elements had to get signed off with them so that they could be used on shows. Actors like Charlie Cox revealed that they had clauses in their contracts for film appearances. Internally, it still seems there was a tie between both as Marvel TV cast members appeared at MCU film premieres. And of course, Marvel TV was successful enough with Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. that they made more shows. The second show to come out was Agent Carter, which was executive produced by the Kevin Feige himself. The show was also created by Christopher Marcus and Stephen McFeely, writers of the Captain America films. And to make things more confusing, that superficial one-sided relationship, which was based on real inner studio awkwardness, by the way, that started to dissolve. It started small. Metro General Hospital from Daredevil appears in Doctor Strange. No big deal, but by the time Endgame rolls around, prospects of characters crossing into film looked a little bleak. But then, Edwin Jarvis. A character from Agent Carter appears and is straight up named. I made a bingo card for when my friends and I saw Endgame for a TV character to appear, and let me tell you, it was not a spot I was expecting to fill, much less by Jarvis of all characters. Later on, also for Endgame, it's revealed by a VFX company that Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. villain Daniel Whitehall was to appear on a holographic panel that got cut. Then a double whammy. During Spider-Man No Way Home, we saw Charlie Cox reprising his role as Daredevil years after the series was canceled on Netflix. Around the same time, Daredevil's arch nemesis Kingpin appeared in Hawkeye. Now, the Disney Plus shows were advertised from the start as connected to the films, and there's no question of their canonicity. After a number of years, Marvel TV would be absorbed by Marvel Studios, and now we're getting Marvel TV characters returning. One of them getting a new show, Daredevil Born Again. And with the release of Echo, the former Netflix shows Daredevil, Jessica Jones, Luke Cage, Iron Fist, and The Punisher were all officially added to the MCU section of Disney+. So was Marvel TV canon? Ah, uh, we can for sure say the Netflix Defenderverse is canon, and also Agent Carter, but technically we haven't heard about the other shows like S.H.I.E.L.D., Runaways, and others. The one show that's been said to be explicitly non-canon is Hellstrom, but even then, it was produced with canon in mind. It's mostly disconnected, but does have its small ties with no contradictions. Could it all be canon? Honestly, I would say they are. There's nothing contradicting anything. And don't say S.H.I.E.L.D. ignores Endgame. They very clearly get around it in the final few seasons, but you don't have to hear it from me. Here it is from Echo's executive producer, Brad Winterbaum. So I can say that we've been, we've been up until this point, We've been a little bit cagey about what's sacred timeline, what's not sacred timeline. That was that was born of, frankly, a period at the studio where we were like, we have to stick the landing with Avengers. Sure. You know, we it was it was another part of the company developing the Netflix stuff. We were aware of what they were doing. They were aware of what we were doing, but it it, it was it was a, it was it was a lot. Sure. It was a lot to balance anyway. But now that. You know, some time has passed. Now that we see how actually how well integrated the stories are, um, I think that I personally, Brad Winderbaum, would be confident in saying it is part of the sacred time. Now that I've given some context as to the canon situation, let's talk about why we should care. Being the massive Marvel fan that I am, I have seen just about every piece of media in the MCU, and there's quite a disparity in how the shows from both Marvel TV and Disney Plus were handled. I've noticed some key differences. Obviously, the entries from Marvel TV didn't feature major characters from the films, but this instead becomes a factor in how character-focused these shows feel. The characters are much more dynamic with interpersonal relationships and goals. By necessity, they have to be written like this. 
but Disney Plus's characters feel flat. They don't have a lot in terms of real growth. Wanda says she learns a lesson after literally taking a whole town hostage. Relationships are either non-existent or over-exaggerated. Nick Fury suddenly has a wife and their trust dynamic lasts all of one episode. Conversely, there's this friendship between all the characters in Loki that doesn't feel earned. Sure, he exposes the truth about the TVA, but then it's treated like everyone's known each other for a lifetime. It's all the payoff, but the actual relationship building takes a backseat to gimmicky set pieces or contrived plots. The exception being Sylvie and Mobius, and even then it's piss poor when in season 2 they focus on their own character motivations only for Loki to forcibly rip them away from things. Yeah, fate of the universe and all that, but their conflicting needs and wants are written more like a reluctance than tension turned realization to save the universe. Whereas Marvel TV follows the ups and downs of several characters, I mean, they don't have the fancy VFX, so they fill time with real moments. Matt and Foggy's relationship as the quote-unquote avocados at law is shown to come from a place of trust. Foggy and Matt are at different places throughout their appearances. In Daredevil Season 1, he has no clue about Matt's alter ego as the devil of Hell's Kitchen, and they're basically two lawyers against the world, fighting for legal justice even for those who can't afford it. Season 2 has their relationship strained after Foggy finds out Matt's identity, eventually ending with him going to work for the law firm from Jessica Jones, going corporate and doing a 180 on fighting for the little man. But he isn't completely out of Matt's life simply being uncomfortable with his double life being a liability. This is backed up in Defenders when Foggy puts his trust in Matt. It ends up with Matt dying, but this is Marvel, no one dies permanently. Come Season 3, Matt comes back, telling Foggy to stay away from him as he's decided to live only as Daredevil. He makes the point that being Foggy's friend puts him in danger. This leaves Foggy angered and confused. The rest of the season is him rebuilding his trust while Matt tries to keep people at arm's length to protect them, making it all the more satisfying at the end when Matt realizes he needs his friends around and restarts their law firm. And that's just one relationship, I haven't even mentioned Karen, much less the many character dynamics written this way throughout all of Marvel TV, the best obviously being Fitzsimmons, hands down the best couple in all of the MCU. It's weird, but limitations tend to steer media into directions that end up working in their benefit. In contrast, the relative freedom on Disney Plus perhaps gives them no direction, necessitating reshoots and rewrites. Falcon and the Winter Soldier's Flag Smashers storyline suffered heavily after being retooled. They were essentially people who felt the world governments were neglecting survivors of the snap in oversimplification. So they resort to downright terrorism to get what they want, and by the end, Sam Wilson, aka the Falcon, aka Captain America, says to stop calling them terrorists. Dude, they exploded things and put people in danger. What do you want? Of course they're terrorists. They try to push some sympathetic story with Carly, the leader of the Flag Smashers, but it's hard to feel sorry for her when she's pushing an extreme. It's not like she was forced to do this and was left with no choice. It's literally just random violence. Honestly, the stuff with John Walker was way more interesting in that his very presence didn't sit well with Sam or Bucky. It all comes back down to the characters, and no one side is perfect. Both have gems, but also have absolute garbage. But I can at least remember the characters on one side more than another. Uh, what's her name? Oh, and him too? Ah, I can't even remember his wife's name. This guy? That guy? Her? His name? Uh, oh, I looked it up. That's Biscuits. Okay, here's the part about Disney Plus Marvel shows that really grinds my gears the most. I'm usually a fan of having fun with your content and the writing, but it's as if Marvel's punched up the scripts way too hard in terms of the humor, the gratuitous cameos, and the feel. Yeah, the films and even the Marvel TV shows have humor, and I understand different comics like She-Hulk do have a more tongue-in-cheek writing style. I liked Deadpool and the way it doesn't take itself seriously. But when is it too much? Easy, when the humor has to stand out as a spectacle or substitutes actual character writing and plot. I like the variety and different vibes for each Marvel entry, but I feel like everything is a snarky comment or a fourth wall breaking question. It's Reddit dialogue. It's the kind of talk Redditors would make if they were in the MCU. Too much meta and self-awareness takes you out of the world. You're no longer immersing yourself into the universe. You're instead a passive audience member looking into a fishbowl. This was a big problem back in 2015 with Age of Ultron that Marvel corrected for future films, so why go back on that? And humor isn't necessarily a bad thing, but it feels like the joke takes precedence and the plot is written around it, hence Megan the Stallion. 
And if not outright humor, it's more the simplification of shows and stories to their most basic components, rather than going into what made the original so great. Take Miss Marvel, where they did lean into the cultural and religious differences Kamala Khan faces, but they forget that in the comic run, she also deals with her own image. The show reduces it down to a single line. And, and let's be honest, it's not really the brown girls from Jersey City who saved the world. As much as the focus on her faith was good, it all seems pretty surface level when not put into the context of her living in a much different world. In the comics, she straight up turns into her hero, Carol Danvers, aka Captain Marvel. I can understand the touchy implications of Kamala race changing, but I think as a minority myself, her learning to be comfortable in her own appearance is a great message. It addresses self-confidence, body dysmorphia, and challenges beauty standards. Even them changing her embiggening powers from stretchiness to light-based Green Lantern-esque projections fails to inform us about her insecurities as a character, at least not in the same way that manipulating your own body does. And it's not exclusive to comics to screen adaptations. The release of Echo, as I mentioned earlier, canonizes and takes cues from the Netflix Marvel shows with a more serious tone except it feels like a sanitized general idea of those shows. You can see it in decisions like giving her a comic relief sidekick and her cousin Biscuits, good thing I looked up his name earlier, and Maya being so cartoonishly standoffish to her other cousin. I'm sorry, it's just a hard sell that Maya thinks of Kingpin as family, but she literally has a family member texting to check up on her. Don't leave her on red. It's not justified her ghosting her family, unlike Matt distancing himself from his friends in Daredevil Season 3. He was perceived as dead and his very presence puts them in danger, but at least he informed Foggy. Maya Lopez has Fisk after her and her family, which is funny enough the same thing that Matt has happening to him in Daredevil Season 3, but she can't even text her cousin and say, sorry bestie, there's a big bald man from New York after you. I don't have an issue with her exploring her Choctaw heritage, but it feels a little icky that it all led up to giving her and her family boring superhero powers in the end. Yeah, Grandma, you get powers too, I guess. The coolest part about her is that she's a trained killer, and she even goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with Hawkeye and Daredevil himself. They're both really good at what they do, and why can't she just be really good at what she does? Guess they gotta give her magical powers. Just saying. To sum up, the Disney Plus shows prioritize keeping it straightforward. They don't leave things up to the audience, nor do they build up strong characters and relationships. And I recognize that shorter episode counts as well as overall production issues also affecting the films contribute to this. As we approach the number of individual Disney Plus shows outnumbering the Marvel TV shows, I think we can all agree that making things work on television is hard. Ironically, what once was a capitalistic money-making opportunity in the least political way cements itself as one of the most creative, enjoyable pieces of content in the MCU. Yet the more creatively free, studio-produced shows are as cookie-cutter as it gets. Ideally, the perfect Marvel show will take cues from both eras, take the storytelling and characters from Marvel TV with the integration, budget, and VFX of Disney+. Plus. To those who haven't watched the Marvel TV shows, I say give them a chance. Except in humans. Fucking humans. Whoa, a Marvel video? I want to start making more varied content on this channel, including Marvel and my other pop culture interests, so help support me by subscribing and leaving a like. Also, tell me what your favorite Marvel TV or Disney Plus show is in the comments and why. If you want to have an in-depth discussion on this, follow me on Twitch or join my Discord server. Links in the description.